a slightly different talk. Um, I'm quite on an abstract level, and that is related to my current situation, which is quite chaotic. So I just got this uh, chair position at University of Bamberg two years ago. Um, so I'm more in the area of AI right now, and we have to build up their structures, including new study programs. I'm very much involved in these things. So I'm doing much less of formalization right now than I wish to. Um, and then my family also moved to Dubai, which creates another level of chaos in that. So I've uh, prepared for today's talk a couple of comments. It's more a position statement. And um, it's uh, intended to be also slightly provocative, so to, to invite for controversial debates. You see that the first one, um, so I think with the formalization of maths, and that is a good thing, actually, we really have time. We are not under kind of um, uh, high pressure in this, so to say, from a societal perspective to get that done in, in two or three years. So there's, there's time to do that. Are there areas at the moment, in particular, if in, a, in the context of AI developments, the situation is quite different. Um, and uh, when I actually was first confronted with mathematics as a young student in the early 90s at uh, Saarbrück University, I was first sent, of course, to take these maths classes because I was told that is fundamental. This is what you have to do to understand all of that that is coming. Well, now in retrospective, what I was told there is completely irrelevant. It, it, it's, not, it's not something that is really important in my work, and that has to do with the fact that math seems actually much less fundamental to many of the other, other areas, law, legal um, applications, and so on, um, than I already, uh, originally thought it. Um, and I think the same for several folks here in the room. So, um, well, you see, the reason what got me in, in the very first place into the era of mathematics was this kind of confrontation yeah. with the, the promises of AI already back then. So I was in a scholar like Michael of York Siegmann, and he was slightly provocative. He told, we are building the systems who can do maths better than every mathematician. And he was telling that already at the beginning of the 90s, so when everyone thought, well, let's first solve chess playing and these things. So even that was not solved at the time. But nevertheless, I got deeply interested because I thought, yes, with maths, that you can probably find uh, out whether there's a significant difference between what is human-like and what is machine-like. So um, looking at mathematical discovery, mathematical theory improving, and so on, that was my motivation to dive into that. But from the perspective of, of AI development, how far can we go with automation of mathematics? On the other side, I was early on confronted with the idea of formal methods, so to really develop formal um, security, trust, trusted um, algorithms so we can 100% um, sure that they do what they are intended to do. So I developed over the years many different kinds of um, activities, but what is now the kind of core of the research is the discrepancy of these two sides. So we had significant developments on AI in direction of machine learning, um, but very strong. I know that we work with ChatGPT, and even in mathematics it can be quite helpful already. And on the other hand, we had this idea this idea is still present of, of being really, really sure what your systems are doing, of verifying things. And there's, of course, now a big tension between these two sides. And my personal conviction is that we can overcome that by getting this kind of um, yin and yang symbol here rotating between developing tools that work on the sub-symbolic side, but integrating them very tightly also with symbolic AI methodology to get the trusted aspects in the game. And I think there's a relation, I mean, you have seen it probably by many talks by others to what um, also persons in psychology tell you um, about two layers um, of cognition. And system one, as described in, in the works of Kahneman and others, uh, that is responsible for fast, intuitive action. So you do things without even reflecting on it. But then there's also the other layer, namely a slow and rational control layer um, that, for instance, also often in retrospect, um, looks at the decision you have made and tries to, to find out was it good, wasn't that good, and so on. So there's an interaction eventually going on between these two layers. That's one of the hypotheses out there in psychology. Particularly interesting now because that here to me has an analogy to data-driven AI, this fast intuitive layer, and the other one, the slow, rational, uh, reflective layer um, is something where symbolic AI methodology and theory improving and logics um, have uh, something to say. And I think it's therefore quite interesting to think about connecting those two layers uh, in the sense of hybrid AI development or neuro-symbolic AI development. 
And I think that is particularly relevant now for um, you think uh, when you see now the, the, the AI Act and the, the proposed distinctions between these different layer, layers of criticality for developing um, um, uh, the, the system development at the high risk level. So where you want to come up with real guarantees for computer systems, where you don't even want to you know, just have this one failure of an AI system, but we want to have, again, this kind of 100% assurance and trust that you uh, can come up with. So uh, what I've been doing there for the last years is looking at the idea of symbolic, developing a symbolic control mechanisms for sub-symbolic reasoning. So can we formalize foundational theories in ethics and law and so on in order to control uh, whatever AI system you have? Um, is that possible? And that, of course, is also a foundational question, but now you're confronted with what are foundations of ethical and legal reasoning to do. Um, and if we can do that, think about it, then you can think about aligning, for instance, a trained system by synthesizing data from the theory over the time and so on and trying to get the both layers aligned. So, you know, you can train bottom up from behavior, from data in the real world, ethical, normal behavior in, in yellow systems and top down, you could declaratively state using formal logical methods, uh, theories that, for instance, come from societal processes, and then try to get them. Okay, so um, that, is, that is the vision here. And of course, in order to start with that, um, we have to work on experiments in the area of formalizing legal ethical theories, like you um, are here confronted with typically formalizing foundational and, and more abstract mathematical theories. It's now about ethical legal theories. And the interesting thing here is very often it's not even clear what logics you need for that. So logics themselves became, become part of the game. We are here in the area of normative reasoning, of the ontic reasoning. Very often you have here uh, the problem that you have to be partially inconsistent, robust, the notion of obligation is so that you, you know, you say you should do that, but people don't do it. When you use classical logic, then you are typically in inconsistency situation. So you have explosion and you need to avoid it. So you need to, to have partially inconsistent, uh, partial inconsistency robust. And that is what deontic logics and so in the area of normative reasoning are. Um, so we have therefore proposed a knowledge engineering methodology, which you also saw in the title of my talk in the very beginning, which we call Logic Key. So it's a knowledge, uh, knowledge engineering methodology that has a particular emphasis also on the question, how can I be now uh, pluralistic with regards to the choice of an object logic itself? Right? So therefore, I take a sufficiently expressive Meta logic, so for instance, the logic that um, 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 and Bill Farmer just presented, uh, he also bases Alonso on. So I at the moment work with Isabel Hall, so that's uh, just simple type theory basically, but it could be others. Uh, it needs to be sufficiently expressive so that it can talk about other logics um, as a meta logic. And then on top of that, you talk now about domain specific languages, like for instance, uh, you need in the legal or ethical normative domain. And then you can formulate applications, for example, these applications to govern um, AI systems. So that is, that is this interest. And at the moment, I work very often with shallow semantical embeddings of object logic. So where you introduce the connectives of the logic you're interested in, say, in, in, in uh, deontic logic, just as abbreviations of the meta logic. <coughs> the benefit of working with shallow semantical embeddings is that I get a high degree of automation. Remember that we need to explore the properties of the logics themselves. So I want to interact with the systems and I want to have response. I don't know exactly what the logic will be. So the experimentation is a an, an, an significant part of that. And therefore, I'm interested in a high degree of automation. Shallow semantical embeddings often give me that. In some of the works at the moment, we also work with combinations of deep and shallow, where we even need the, the interaction. OK. Um, so what to take away of that is that we need frameworks uh, where these kind of modeling of the foundational logic underlying the theories we're interested become negotiated. 
Uh, and this is for me particularly interesting now in this area of applications in direction of AI and many, many others. So and we have done that, for instance, uh, in the area of uh, um, legal normative reasoning, we work now with the ontic logics in combination with modal logics of references, do experiments, then we have, for instance, worked a lot with just the uh, <coughs> higher order modal logics, but also with uh, intentional higher order modal logics, even hyper intentional ones, I say a bit more about examples in that direction, and a lot with free logic. I mean, we heard about free logic basically also in the talk of Bill implicitly. And um, this is something I think that is completely, um, yeah, I don't know, not taken serious enough, the, the aspects that free logic can give you. Um, if you have time, I come back to that later. So that means recently you see more papers from my side, not in the formalization of mathematics so much, but papers like these. So conditional normative reasoning as a fragment of our or modeling value-oriented legal reasoning in logic key, and so on and so on. So that, that are the recent experiments. So instead of doing maths, now often doing uh, foundation development of foundational theories in that area. But there's another piece of work which I'm eventually not so many aware with, uh, of, which we have done, uh, which is also in that setting, and, but that goes now in the direction of philosophy. Uh, so for instance, Ed Salter is at Stanford, you know him from the uh, Stanford Encyclopedia, uh, Encyclopedia of Philosophy, main editor. So he's working since 30 years or longer on this uh, piece here, Principia Logico Metaphysica. The ambition is to give a foundation of all of metaphysics, including, of course, pluralistic foundations for mathematics. So he also develops uh, foundational um, theories of mathematics, and he wants to be uh, pluralistic and flexible in there. So have a look at, at some of the later chapters in, in what he does. That is a kind of challenging entry level though, uh, when you look at the foundational logic he starts with. It's a relational, hyper-intentional, higher order modal logic. And then he develops out of that starting point um, also then foundations not just for for uh, mathematics, but for other areas as well. An interesting thing is also that he distinguishes in, in explicitly in that logic between two modes of predication. The one is for objects that really exist. So you, you could say something like uh, Detective Pinkerton, a real detective, is a detective. So you can apply the, the predicate detective to, to Pinkerton. So you would say something like um, detective of Pinkerton. So that is the normal mode of predication, writing it on the right hand side. But he has another mode. When you talk now about abstract objects, then you would write it to the left. So that would be um, Sherlock Holmes is a detective. So this abstract object, Sherlock Holmes. So his logic is very ambitious. Uh, so it, two modes of predication, hyper-intentionality, and then the restriction to relational um, context. And um, Daniel Kirshner took the methodology, logic key, and the ambition was to show that we can even, using now classical higher order logic, which is quite orthogonal to exactly these things and doesn't have things like that, can nevertheless be used to actually formalize uh, the foundational entry point for that work in, in a system like Isabel Hall. Uh, so you find that also in the archive of formal proofs, a uh, significant part of this has been formalized. And even better, so using that methodology in interaction, he was then able to find a paradox. Uh, so it's 24,000 lines of formal code he produced. He, he was able to find a paradox inside, and he helped Etzata to, uh, to, to correct that. So the interaction was very fruitful because now the combination of a domain expert, Zalta, the student, Daniel Kirshner, working with a proof assistance system in interaction was able to de de detect that paradox that Zalta thought of being rid of by starting with exactly such a kind of logic here, the restriction to relational and so on. Um, and, and, and this interaction between the student and the proof assistance system was crucial to find that paradox because it quite complicated. So many years of development didn't see that, but then there came the student and he was able to detect it and fix it. Okay, so what we are essentially, and there are a couple of papers, but Daniel is now the head of the solidity development with Ethereum, so he doesn't publish, he has now other things to do, he's now developing an eventually new branch of the solidity language. I have to push him a bit, he would have been a good person to be here as well. Um, so um, this is about, you know, yeah, 
juggling around with re representational objects. So we have um, even now the object logics as being subject of study within, uh, within the prover systems. And, and this is what we do. So we are interested in foundational theories. Um, you have an, an, a theory or you have an argument in philosophy or whatever. You are asking the question, what is the, the basic logic I need? Then you try to, to formalize these different layers. You conduct experiments and typically you get back and have falsification experiences or something goes wrong and you need to go through circles. But the interesting and important point is that the object logics itself are here um, negotiable and a part of the study. Interesting in the future would of course be to have that fully automatically <laughs> um, supported, so to get the human out of the loop. But I think there's a long, some, some time to go to do that. But wait, maybe we can brainstorm up what would be needed for that. So to get the human out here, just a proposal of a theory, a proposal of a law text, and the question, can you find out the logic where this all here becomes rational? Okay, and this is an interesting comment by Wolfgang Bibel uh, related to that. So he said, well, but abstract representations have been objects of studies in AI from the very beginning. And he calls them representational objects or repräsentierende Objekte in German. And he says, well, um, isn't it interesting that from the very beginning they have been key to symbolic AI and they can explicitly be experimented with in the computer. And by doing that, they somehow become now not, not any, they are not anymore just kind of objects of abstract thinking. They are, they are <coughs> physical in a sense in the computer. So we are transitioning in a way um, from, from, um, from, uh, a, a kind of thought experiments about these, these kind of operational structures to um, experimental science with it. So, um, and, and he said then, well, isn't it the case that symbolic logic, uh, symbolic AI and, and, and logic in combination with these computer experimentation deserves an increased attention as an experimental natural science? And that's interesting. And uh, in his in his paper, um, he talks more about mathematical theories. So, but if you think now about logic here and applications in other areas, then you see that this comment here is absolutely right, in particular also about the discovery of, of new um, under, uh, uh, underlying logical for, for certain areas. So that is uh, my comment one. Uh, so you see, um, I think that in these other areas, the pressure, sorry. Yeah. Uh, just a few slides. Yeah. So, you uh, Simon have this uh, physical symbol systems hypothesis, is, are you saying the same thing? You mean that slide here? Hmm? Yeah, is it the same thing as the physical symbol systems hypothesis? Yes. Yeah, he emphasized it from that side, and he said, basically, think about it. And but even what we what we can do now is focus here on on exploration of um, the principles of rational thinkings in different areas, and exploration of logics, and not just mathematical theories. And so um, so I had an, an interesting interaction with him um, about this paper here in Germany, Computer Creative Wissenschaft. Um, okay, so uh, the end of my, my you know, um, slightly controversial comment one, and there's a comment two, and the other, the other, the, the last two that is mentioned, and we won't have time anyway. Comment two is about um, cut elimination versus cut introduction. So sorry to those who have been to the, the Dutch tool workshop. Um, I presented that also slightly there as a challenge, but I think here is an, um, a different, a slightly different audience, so it might be interesting to do. So with, with cut elimination, I think now in terms of proof automation as a part of um, proof assistance and so on. So in the last century, when you wanted to submit a paper to, to Kate, and so you typically, you, you should have a kind of uh, soundness and completeness proof for your calculus in, and of course, a proof of cut freeness. And so that was a typical pattern, right? But I think now that we have many good automated theorem provers out there, in that century, we would sh should focus much stronger again on the idea of introducing cut formulas in a controlled way. And I have a nice example now to illustrate that. Um, and this is about um, achieving eventually fully <coughs> automatically uh, quite soon, and we are already quite near there, um, exponentially sm uh, smaller proofs. So um, how can you get exponentially smaller? I mean, there's these important papers out there by Gödel and by Bus and so on. And um, there's also the example that I want to point out uh, or 
um, go into now in the next few minutes. Um, that was proposed by Bulos. Um, and a nice example on, on um, where you can see the speed up of proofs really working in practice. And uh, well, we published on that in that paper here recently, who finds the short proof here last year. And that was intended mainly to the knowledge representation and reasoning community who often, you know, confronts you with, oh, T improving in Hall is undecidable and, and hence often therefore not suited at all for practical applications. And I want to, wanted to counter that argument with working out that example here more uh, precisely. And uh, so they focus in very often then on less expressive logics like FOIL, so that you are in a decidable fragment and you have your decidability proof in your, um, in your paper typically. Um, and, and here we wanted to challenge that. So, and what we do is a little thought experiment because I say, no, no, it's exactly the opposite. If you have an expressive logic, then there's hope that you find proofs because you might find short proofs which you can't get otherwise and with reference to these, these results on shorter proofs. So let's look at an, a concrete example or this concrete thought experiment. So we have two persons, Holly and Falbert, in that thought experiment and they arrive at the gates of heaven and both want to enter. Uh, but unfortunately, there's only space for one of them that day, and the continuing days as well. Uh, and they are expected now to solve that with an ATP contest. So um, the person who wins that contest is the winner and is allowed to enter. So both of the persons are asked to choose a first order logic problem. So a logic in an in a more, less expressive logic. And both are asked to select either a first order or a higher order ATP, right? So, and the question is now, whose ATP solves the problem proposed by the other person first wins? So, Holbert chooses a first order ATP and Holly chooses a higher order ATP. And the point I wanted to make is here, clearly the, uh, the, the winning strategy is on the side of a um, higher order person. Um, Okay, so if there's no winner by, mid by midnight, the contest starts over the next day, so they can propose new problems. So what is the key? The key here is um, that Holly um, proposes such an example here. <coughs> Bullis Curious Inference. So there's a paper um, out in the Journal of Philosoph Philosophical Logic by, by George Bullis. Um, and in that example, you see a couple of first order axioms um, where the first three axioms actually are an axiomatization of the Ackermann function. So the f is the Ackermann function and the f function is extremely fast flowing. So, so far is that when you have uh, the, uh, the Ackermann function applied to 5, 5, um, it, we're talking about already a number that is um, um, beyond the atoms in the universe. So that proof if you do it by modus ponens using the axioms 4 and 5 for the uninterpreted predicate D we want to work now with, um, wouldn't work. So axioms 4 and, 5 say, uh, 4 and 5 say we have an uninterpreted predicate D that holds for 1 and that goes with the successor. And then the challenge is prove it for a large number. Okay, So you can see the proof is there. Just Infinite, yeah, uh, finitely many, but a high number of modus ponens steps. But it's so large that no first order system could ever do it, or even if that's you know doable in, an, in a decidable fragment, and so could ever could ever do that in practice. But there is a short proof in higher order logic that was uh, published by Bulos in that paper on one on a single page, and that the key here is powerful lemmata as instances of the comprehension axiom. So cut introductions. Guess interesting short names for some more complex properties and work with them, and then you get a short proof. That is the message here in the paper of, of Poulos. We already did a verification of that uh, many years ago. So exactly what we did in, in that paper here, Chad Brown and myself in MISA and Omega at the time was an, a formalization of that, uh, that, that proof exactly at that level of granularity as you see it in, in Bulo's paper in proof resistance. So that can be done. And automation already at the time was good enough to actually automate all these kind of substatements here. But now the question is, can we also get that fully automatic? By the way, here you see the use of the comprehension axioms. So you use them to introduce short notions like N, E, and Q, and P here, um, and then you work with them in the proof. 
and that gets you down on the layer of complexity. So instances of comprehension and axioms that need to be guessed and that come out of the blue and that, that look like genius here in, in, in that, short, that short thing. Okay, so what we did is, um, now in that recent experiment, again, we formalized that here, you see it in Isabel Holt, so that's an, an, a super simple thing to do, of course. And then uh, you can ask Sledgehammer to prove, of course, it's hopeless. Why? Because now you have a context where there's no even free variable, higher order variable. We have a first order context. And comprehension principles are not in there because we know that we have lambda abstraction and comprehension is not needed. But here we need a cut introduction to introduce this lemmata. When we do an introduction of a couple of interesting definitions, then we get this short proof. So let's do that. Let's give help to the theorem provers and try to introduce some of the, the definitions in the spirit of Budo. So I also simplified them a, lot, a, a bit, so I don't need as many as Budo in the group. Um, so what you basically need is the following. You introduce um, a, a notion of inductive set. Um, so X is an inductive set defined over the, the E, that is the one symbol, so, so one and the successor. And then you, then you talk about the smallest inductive set, can also be easy done in higher order. And then you relate the Ackermann function to the smallest inductive set. So basically the property P says X and Y have property P if, if the Ackermann function applied to X and Y is in the smallest inductive set defined over um, E and S. That is what, what you see here. And as soon as I give these definitions uh, to the t improvers, they find a proof quickly. One second. The proof is highly intelligent still, so a really cool proof, but they can, so we are there already with the development of the technology that all is needed is the introduction of these definitions. And you can even contact them and essentially you only need one, so the, the N can be unfolded in the definition of P and the inset as well, so you have just one definition that needs to be guessed, and then you get the short proof. You can also formulate it in TPTP syntax, then it looks like that, and the challenge um, Ah, and um, I don't have time to further dive into that. So in the paper, you see now how the proof is uh, of E is an, a really intelligent one and comes up with cool, clever lemmata. So I, we don't have time to dive into that, but, but just have a look at the paper and then you see how the, the, the proof developed by the theorem prover E uh, really, really <coughs> synthesizes interesting lemmata on that way. Um, and, and this is doable already in current technology. So here you can then clearly see how the proof is developed um, and you have the references to these different clauses um, as spit out by the, the e prover. Okay, so the, the challenge here is, and that is something we could look at, um, how close we are in proof assistant system using, and that is the question, what technology to come up with such kind of definitions eventually automatically from the context. To me, they don't look like that magic at all anymore. It's, you know, a definition of an inductive set over these constructor symbols and the smallest inductive <coughs> set and relating it to whatever you want to prove. If you could do it for that example, I think you can do it for other examples as well and it, it would be an interesting thing to do. Uh, so that should be a tiny exercise to formalize that, that thing <coughs> other proof assistants see, see whether they can already do that proof automatically as I presented. So can that be done automatically in Lean or in Coq already right now as, as we do it here in Isabel? And, and what, what from the perspective of these proof assistant systems would be the right way to come up with a complete automation of that? Do we need AI technology, machine learning? Is it just proof planning? Is it, what, what is the right thing to do here? So that's the story. Um, so we need both robust Hull ATP last century, but now clever cut introduction, I think this century. Um, how to achieve that is a question. And um, the challenge would be controlled reasoning with cut strong principles in general. And here we have the introduction of definitions. There are other cut strong principles, of course, that are interesting. Um, that brings me to the end of comment two. And uh, my, my comment three simply is an, a, a one slide statement. So I think that the tree logic deserves more attention. 
Um, so free logic, we heard about it also implicitly earlier, is a logic that is free, first of all, of existential presuppositions. That is also where the name free comes from. So for instance, domains here could be empty, but you distinguish explicitly between existing and non-existing uh, non objects. So it's a very, very suitable foundation for dealing with undefinedness and parcelity. So I was pointed to add by Dana Scott at the time, and I didn't know even about it after being in the community for many, many years. So I was completely surprised, and after I saw the beauty of that, why that has not been looked at more seriously. So you have the principles like all terms denote, also those definite descriptions which you know point to non-existing objects, but they are non-existing objects. So they are outside of the, the range of what you consider existing. And the bound variables range only over the existing entities and free variables um, range over existing and non-existing. So that are the basic principles and this is very elegant what you can build on top of that. Uh, and for instance, that is the works we did then with Dana to show that in direction of category theory. Um, so with uh, Jonas, who's also here, and then with um, others, Luca Tiemens before, who unfortunately left for industry as well. So that's, that's one comment. Uh, why, why don't we pay more attention to free logic? And the other one is, um, on model finding, respectively counter model finding. In most of my works in the last years, tools like Sledgehammer and uh, in the end you get an, an, a verified proof, it's a wonderful thing. But on the way there, most of the time you got so fruitful input from counter model finding. Misconceptions to our, uh, to our logics, the exploration of logics and get counter example, that doesn't work in that context and so on. And to my surprise, it worked quite well in the exploration, for instance, of deontic logic, unless you hit some of these deontic logics um, that only have infinite model structures, where we don't have infinite model finders yet, even though there could eventually be some. So this is really a kind of, you know, I, I think for PhD students at the moment, in the context of these proof assistance systems, looking at model finding in particular for infi simple infinite model structures is an, a very important thing to do. Um, yeah, and that, that's the end of my, my presentation. So the summary of position statements, um, and here we have them again. Hi, uh, So uh, you, you, you told the story about, about Holly and, and uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I guess Holly is not going to be winning this contest, at least so far, right? With the material that she can't she automate it, but yeah. there's hope if we can solve that here for example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But she can block the other person from winning. So right. Okay. So one one, one comment on like, like I was showing at this work five years ago when we did this enigma reasonably working. There, there was a very nice example in this direction when you proved Knaster Tarski. Suddenly we could prove Knaster Tarski in Wieser, but only by cheating, by giving it the definition of the comprehension term. And, and that, that was the corollary. I can do a one page proof in Wieser if this one liner which defines the comprehension yeah. terms. Is, is given by God, right? Like <coughs> if, if it fall, falls down from, from heaven and you are inspired to, to, to write down the, the, the definition of the yeah. fixed point list. Yeah, but my, my feeling really is if we could do that in an, in an interesting guided way, then we might be now at the point yeah, where we could find yeah. automatic proof yeah, of surprising yeah. results on the automatic. Yeah. 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 One of the observations I think we made early on is that higher order unification, which is, tends to be bad mouthed as being too complex, um, is essentially, and, and is generalization to some kind of a constraint reasoning thing, um, often gives us yeah. these um, cuts that we need to introduce. Yeah. If you look at the, if you look at Cantor's diagonalization argument, that is one of these cut terms that is actually found by by high order unification, and I think that was w w where I would start yeah. looking. Yeah, I think that plays a role here in, in these uh, parts <coughs> here. 
So this is a higher order uh, lemma that's proved on the way forward from the axioms by the E prover. And in there, to get that synthesized, there's higher order unification going on. There must be higher order unification going on to some extent. And so that is a mixture of um, exploiting the power of um, synthesis using higher order unification with the right uh, definition you introduce. And this interplay makes it possible that you can find this um, this proof is an automated team group as already now, so higher order, the higher order versions of these first order proofs. So. Yeah. I also would like to comment or maybe start a bit of a discussion on your first comment on, on this, like math is now sort of not your focus and the verification of AI or whatever ethical and legal systems. I, I, I would say I think, yes, so some people say that AI is the new math, for example, like, like people are sort of uh, saying that, that sort of stuff, that, that it's equally important for development of sciences as mathematics, for, for, for uh, but, but, but also I, I think one way how to see it is that math is really all, all these things, right, like it's basically the, the, the father of computer science and, and like all, all these logical systems, in some sense, sort of developed from 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 math. So, so I I, I, I wouldn't see it yes. so much as yeah, sort of course, yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah, yeah. The question is what you define now as mathematics, yeah, and yeah, you could yeah. say that all that is yeah, being part yeah. of mathematics. But for that community, it might be relevant to reflect again on the thing. If you only focus on the development, which is a wonderful and so important thing, on the development of curricula for mathematics, we might just miss out in. We might just, you know, um, um, specify and get too concrete with our methodologies and with the machinery we build up for exactly that purpose and then miss out on the other ends. Yeah. And, and that is what I wanted to find out. That one, your, I really like your proposal. Um, I think one of the biggest problems we have in AI right now is that anybody who's ever downloaded TensorFlow and got it installed now calls themselves an AI expert. Yes. And if you, <laughs> if you make them tie this up to some kind of a symbolic level, then those would fall out. So I, yes. I, I, I support, uh, from, a, from a practical and hiring point of view, I support your proposal. I, I, I probably, you have the same problem in classes, right? So you, yeah. I've, I've been, you know, just pressured to to, to develop this new uh, study program on AI and data science at University of Bamberg, so lots of Excel sheet filling and so on. But what you can see is exactly that phenomena now in our classes. We, we, we still start, but with the students we have, they go all in these AI classes, and as soon as it gets hard, logic and so on, you avoid that to be, because you get that stamp of being now an AI expert very easily by just training a model. And, and and on the other hand, to, to attract persons then to from that crowd, also many clever ones, to go and to take the deep, you know, take a course on Isabel or Lean or Cock and get acquainted with it, and why should I do that, right? So that is a problem. <laughs> May I add another a fifth point yeah. to your um, we already talked about this in Dark Store. I think that might be interesting for this crowd as well. Um, People who started out their career in the Jörg Siegmann's group, like Christoph and myself, and by, a proxy, by proxy maybe Josef and so on, um, consider formal methods and formalized mathematics as part of AI, an essential part of AI. And um, many people in the formal methods group um, community kind of are very proud of having emancipated from AI and we're our own thing now. But I think we might want to rethink that stance and um, think about how we connect to AI. I think it's very important in, for the future to do what just what you've been propagating, what Jack Siegmann has been propagating, what I've been propagating all along is that we need to somehow bring those two things together and um, either via what Christoph says, 
controlling AI, or as Josef does, um, kind of uh, learning how to control these super exponential search processes that are given by symbolic methods. Um, or as a new foundation for all of AI, or those kind of things. And, but I think we need to, nowadays, not just for funding reasons, um, embrace AI and um, maybe make AI better. Because at some point, even the people who do machine learning see that we need some kind of a propositional level. And by the way, they are inventing great new tools. And if you look closely at them, those are and, and or, and not, and sometimes <laughs> even for all, but mostly over a finite, over a finite domain. And we have to be very careful here. And not be scared to make our, to get our hands dirty by talking to people who use TensorFlow and so on. Another, yeah. Shankar. You have a good question that that's true. Yes. Uh, I, I actually strongly agree with you, but on the other hand, we did get kicked out. And that served us quite well. Oh, come on, get over uh, Let's get over ourselves. Our time in the wilderness was not spent. Yes, I, that I agree on totally. But I think this is an area, this is something, as with the four initial things, we should actually think about. Are you proposing any of these things for work groups? Well, we could, with a group of people, just look at how good the, the automation of that example is in um, how that is um, So of, of uh, Buddhist uh, inference in other, <coughs> in other systems and in, in a brainstorming, so that wouldn't be a longer session because I think if it's going to be kind of learning from data thing, then it's a longer project eventually because we don't have the data here right now. Um, but, but maybe there are also other ideas that could come up where you could invent these kind of definitions now for this yeah. example um, in a good direction.